Thanks for the kind introduction and also thanks for inviting me to give this talk on photonic glasses and fiber, really this overview of the research done in my group. So the work is also done, uh, of course, with many collab collaborators, colleagues, students, technicians from many universities. And also the work is, has only been possible because of the various funding agencies, facilities, but also industry partners. And going back to the first slide, so I'm also since recently uh, with a new Center of Excellence in Optical Microcombs for Breakthrough Science. So I show this and so uh, the talk has two main parts. The first is really some basics about glass science, so glass composition, structure, properties and fabrication. And the second part is about a few examples of glasses, fibers and their applications. And the conclusion is a comparison of different glass types. So what is glass? So shown here on the example of quartz and uh, silica. Quartz is a crystal. Uh, the composition is SiO2 and it's composed of silicon oxide tetrahedra as shown on the schematic arranged in a regular way. On the other side, silica is a glass, has the same chemical formula of SiO2, but now the uh, silicon oxide tetrahedra are arranged in a random way, so there is no long range order. So this is an amorphous solid with a structure of that of the liquid. So it's a frozen uh, a solid with a frozen in liquid structure. So another way to look at a glass is when a melt is cooled down, then it has here the option for many crystals at uh, this a melting point or crystallization point, then there is a sharp phase transition from liquid to solid. But some melts under certain circumstances, they go over this point, they go further down in temperature and then they, the structure is frozen in and then we talk uh, from a glass. So when I started to work with glass, for me glass, the word glass was always the traditional glasses, so the inorganic non-metallic glasses. Uh, we uh, know in our households, the lapware, the window panes, in terms of research, it was for me the optical glasses and fibers. Thanks to Amelia, I got to know about inorganic metallic glasses, so special alloys. And also through collaboration with other people, I also knew then more about the organic or thermoplastic polymer, so they can be considered as organic glasses. So in my talk, I will focus on the inorganic non-metallic glasses and then in particular the optical glasses. Before uh, going further into the, the glass science, a few slides on the fiber fabrication steps. It's always three steps. First, making the glass, then turning the glass into a preform, which has the structure on a millimeter scale, so microscopic structure, and then drawing this preform to fiber. For making the glass, there are two main uh, fabrication technologies. One is the melting, and the other is the chemical vapor deposition. I will talk about this later on. For preform fabrication, there are really a range of uh, techniques available, casting, extrusion, machining, stacking, 3D printing. Interestingly, so there are many methods to make a preform, to make a fiber. There's really only one method of heating up the preform and draw it down to fiber. I just would like to point out that the vapor deposition, the casting, they can be considered as making the glass or making the preform really depends on the context. So I want to go through two uh, preform fabrication techniques, the extrusion and the ultrasonic machining, because these are the technologies we use in Adelaide. So the extrusion works taking a glass billet 
placing it on top of a metallic structure, we call it an extrusion die. Both are heated up, a force is applied, and then the glass is squeezed through the die. And where there is a blockage in the glass flow, a hole is formed in the preform or in the glass, and these holes then go along the whole length of the preform. As is shown here, there, this technique allows to make a vast array of very different structures from polymers and glasses. So the highest extrusion we have done is up to 1,100 degrees Celsius. Uh, these examples here hopefully show you an almost unlimited range of structures can be made. The surface is fire polished, so very smooth, which is then of advantage for uh, the, the fiber later on. We can make very small features and also large aspect ratios. In the last five years, uh, we, um, in the group, we have a 3D metal printer and we use the 3D metal printer to make our dies, which then allows us to uh, make new die structures and therefore also new preform structures. And this then translates into new fiber structures. So the other technique is milling and drilling. So we have an ultrasonic CNC machine for doing that. This allows a very high geometrical precision in drilling or milling holes or other structures. The ultrasonic mode is really important because uh, the, the cutter goes through the glass rather like a grinder and not like cutting through the glass so that we achieve a translucent uh, surface quality. So uh, um, such a surface smoothness that it appears translucent. This technique we use almost exclusively for silica glass because it has a high mechanical stability. The limitation is uh, with a, a hole size and the length over which milling and drilling can be achieved. But as you can uh, see also, these slot structures can readily be made via milling. As I mentioned, several techniques to make a preform, but for fiber drawing there is one technique or making the fiber is the drawing technique. The preform is heated over a short length. With time then uh, the glass softens, a drop is formed and comes down due to gravity. And then the fiber is fixed onto a capstan or drum. And what's then happening is the preform moves slowly into the hot zone with millimeter per minute and fast out of the hot zone with meter per minute for our research uh, towers. Commercial draw tower, so our towers, we have a four meter and a six meter tower. Commercial towers, they have a height of 50 meter. So everything then, of course, happens much faster. Important here is a laser gauge to measure the diameter of the preform, sorry, the diameter of the fiber, so that the drum rotation can be adjusted to maintain a certain fiber diameter. And here you see the photograph of a drop coming down. And here you uh, see uh, a range of structures out of silica, soft glass and polymer that we made through this process of preform fabrication and fiber drawing. I will not go into detail just to show you that uh, a range of structures can be made. Now back to uh, basic glass science. I look at it, the glass evaluation for fiber applications. So as we know, the composition determines uh, the properties. Here a few examples of thermal, mechanical and optical properties. The fabrication for optical properties is also important because the fabrication also determines the optical properties, in particular the transmission, the op optical transmission of a glass or of a fiber. But let me start with intrinsic properties really given by the glass composition. And later on then the extrinsic properties. 
Coming back to the glass structure, so I talked about pure silica having this three-dimensional network of covalently bonded SiO4 tetrahedra. If we now add sodium oxide to such a, a glass structure, the sodium ions stay as shown here in this chemical formula. They break these bridging oxygens and form so-called non-bridging oxygens. And this has a profound impact uh, on the glass structure, but also on the glass properties. For example, the glass transition point of pure silica is 1100 degrees Celsius. The more sodium is added, it can then go down to 400 degrees Celsius. So this breakage of the network really gives, gives a tool of uh, tailoring the structure and therefore tailoring the properties. And this is shown here on a few examples, but also on the examples of uh, three different glass types. So one glass type are the oxide glasses. As the name said, the uh, network formers are oxides like uh, silicon dioxide, boron uh, oxide, phosphorus oxide, germanium oxide, and tellurium oxide. And these glasses then they are called silicate, borate, phosphate, germinate, and tellurite. Then there are glasses where not the oxide, but the other trigonides, so sulfide, selenide, and telluride are the anions that form the glass network. And then also halides like fluoride and chlorides can form glasses. So if you look at the bond strengths, then the bond between the silicon and oxide is very strong. And this uh, is contrasted to that between arsenic and sulfide or zirconium and fluoride. So very typical bonds in chalcogenite and uh, fluoride glasses. As I already mentioned, Bridging oxygens, they have strong bond, whereas non-bridging oxygens, they have then a weak bond. If we also look at uh, the cation type, so Si4 plus is an ion, a small ion with a high charge. So therefore the electrons are tightly bound to the silicon. Whereas uh, if there is lead ions in the glass. This is an ion with a large ion, small charge, a lone uh, electron pair, which screens then uh, the, the, or this electron pair can then be easily polarized. And so therefore, from this side to this side, we have an increase in the polarizability and also in the infrared transmission. And so this already shows you infrared transmission goes with weak bonds and therefore goes opposite to the thermal stability of a glass. So unfortunately, uh, nature does not give us an infrared transmitting glass with a high thermal stability because it's not chemically possible. This slide here now looks at the transmission. Also, we call it uh, uh, the, the logarithm of the transmission is the loss for uh, the, in, or the intrinsic transmission really determined by the glass composition. And so the transmission window is on the short wavelength side limited by electronic bent to bend transitions and on the long wavelength side by vibronic transitions, the so-called multiphonon absorption. And so you will hear the term phonon energy also later on. And here you see really uh, an example for silica and zeeblan. So zeeblan is a zirconium fluoride based glass. Silica is silicon dioxide based glass. And so they uh, differ in their composition, in their structure, and therefore they also differ in their transmission window, but also in their minimum loss. This is also shown on this slide in a, uh, in a different way. Uh, so silica has the transmission from the UV to the uh, near infrared. Fluoride goes also from the UV, but up to the mid infrared. Chalcogenite glasses, 
so they go further in the mid infrared and then the heavy metal oxide glasses like lead silicate and telluride they are sort of in between uh, the fluoride and chalcotonite glasses and we'll not go through it come uh, to the spec later on of course depending on the transmission windows these glasses have uh, different applications another way uh, to look at it is to say there is silica and there are the soft glasses and as i already pointed out silica is uh, in terms of microstructured fiber fabrication, uh, the silica uh, preforms are made via in, in our institute via ultrasonic milling and drilling. And for the soft glasses, we use the extrusion. Why this? Why we use the extrusion for the soft glasses becomes apparent on this slide, which shows the glass viscosity as a function of temperature. So if you look here at silica, uh, then up here it's a solid material. Here, this range is where the glass is really molten, it's a melt. In between, there's a viscosity where we can do the fiber drawing and where we can do the extrusion. And what you can see here for silica, high temperatures are needed for the fiber drawing and also for the extrusion and that poses then simply a challenge, an engineering challenge of finding the right dye materials. We ask the soft glasses here, let's silicate in telluride glass, so they have much lower temperature for the material uh, to soften and to melt. And so, uh, such glasses where the temperature does not change much, uh, sorry, the viscosity does not change much with temperatures called a long glass. And then the soft glasses, uh, they are then so-called short glasses because the temperature window for certain processes like extrusion are very small. So coming now, this was all about intrinsic properties. Now I come to extrinsic properties. Now come back to how to make the glass. I talked about preform fabrication, fiber drawing, but first we need to make the glass. And as I already mentioned, there are two main uh, technologies. One is the melting of crystalline raw materials. So the crystalline raw materials, they are mixed in a certain proportion, heated up, a glass melt is formed that is cast into a preheated mold. And during this uh, casting process, the melt cools down so quickly that no crystals can be formed and a glass in amorphous solid is obtained. And then the hot but solid glass is then put in an annealer, slowly cooled down to room temperature simply to avoid cracking. And so uh, in Adelaide, we can melt glasses under ambient atmosphere up to 1400 degrees Celsius but also under controlled atmosphere, then the maximum is 1,250 degrees Celsius. Now, a completely different technology is chemical vapor deposition. This technique is used for making commercially uh, silica, specifically uh, the silica preforms that are turned then in fibers, for example, the fiber optics cables that uh, uh, are the backbone of the internet. So in this technology, uh, the starting point are not solid raw materials, but liquid starting materials with a low boiling point, like silicon tetrachloride and germanium tetrachloride. Oxygen bubbles through, takes uh, the component with it, and goes into a rotating tube. And where's the burner? There's so much heat that this chemical reaction between the chlorides and oxygen takes, part, uh, takes place. Nanoparticulate um, silica is formed, which then in a second, uh, so the burner goes um, along the tube one way, and then it goes back at higher temperature to turn the soot or the nanoparticles into a clear glass. Now you might be aware if you uh, distilled 
our distillation is a way to make high purity water because during the distillation, evaporation, the, the unwanted uh, components, they stay at the bottom uh, of uh, uh, the vessel. And the same is really happening in this case. For example, uh, iron chloride. Iron is an unwanted impurity. It would not evaporate but stay at the bottom of the vessel. So therefore this technique is really, it could be uh, considered as an in situ purification, which is not happening for the melting process. So to compare these two methods once more, chemical vapor deposition for silica, melt quench technique for multi-component glasses. Because of the in situ purification with the chemical vapor deposition, very low losses can be obtained, close to the theoretical loss. Whereas for the melt quench technique, depending on the raw material purity, uh, the, uh, the transmission loss can be four to seven orders of magnitude higher than what's theoretically possible. The downside is with the chemical vapor deposition, the raw materials are limited. That limits, limits glass composition, therefore properties. Whereas for the melt quench technique, I mean, you have the periodic table at your disposal to mix almost any proportion of components. And this gives a huge range of glass compositions and therefore allows property tailoring. Now this all really, uh, these two methods, this consideration plays a role for telecommunication, the submarine cables. For this application, we want to transport the light over 10,000 of kilometers. So we want to transport the light over a length as long as possible, because otherwise several repeaters are needed to boost the signal. And so therefore, low loss is a critical requirement for this application. Now, this slide here compares uh, silica, which is a currently the glass that is used for fiber optics cables. And what's shown here is the theoretical loss and that the practical or the actual best silica fiber is at the theoretical limit. Now, if you look at the Zeblan glass or zirconium fluoride glass, fantastic. It's not only that the transmission window is wider, but also the minimum loss is a hundred times lower compared to silica. So this, if we have then Zeblan fibers at the min minim minimum loss, we would need uh, much less repeaters to transport the signal from one uh, continent to the other. However, as you will see here, this is currently where we are with the actually best Zeblan fiber. So what's going on there? Why is the Zeblan not at the theoretical limit? First, let's look once more at the uh, silica or the, the um, um, basics of loss. So there are, I talked about intrinsic and extrinsic. So intrinsic loss limitations which is the theoretical limit. The key points here are the infrared edge and the Rayleigh scattering. So Rayleigh scattering are um, um, nanoscale or atom scale density fluctuations. And so where the two meet, this is the theoretical minimum loss. And as I have shown, silica is so pure in terms of not containing transition metals also in terms of wavegate imperfections, that extrinsic loss has become negligible. And this is really due to chemical vapor deposition and, uh, as the method for making the glass. Now for uh, Zeblan, we can't use chemical vapor deposition. You have to use the melt quench technique. And this then leads first to higher impurities in the raw materials. And the Zeblan glass itself, so zirconium fluoride based glass, has a tendency of uh, showing uh, easy crystallization. And these two contributions, crystals, they cause scattering. This means uh, loss of light transported in a fiber and transition metal ions, they absorb the light. 
And so how to go now about of getting rid of these unwanted uh, loss contributions? And so this is really uh, uh, my ASC Industry Laureate Fellowship program. In terms of the scattering from the crystals, I'm collaborating with a company, Flawless Photonics. So they uh, investigate, uh, the, it's an engineering company, to build uh, small fiber draw towers so that fiber drawing can be done under microgravity in space, so on the international space stations, because it is known uh, with the lack of gravity, there is re reduced crystal growth. So here on Earth, on IPAS, uh, my team, we will explore how to do raw material purification to remove the absorbing impurities. And hopefully in five years time, we can break through the glass ceiling of Ziblan manufacturing and come close to the theoretical limit uh, in loss for the Ziblan glass. Now change of topic, another application, compact lasers uh, with high beam quality and power. So again, let's look at the two glasses, silica and Ziblan. So both have uh, the, a similar similarity of low refractive index, which is good for achieving high laser power. But they have also differences, as I already pointed out a different uh, transmission window, which is connected with a different phonon energy. So Ziblan has a lower phonon energy and the rare earth solubility is very different for the two glasses. So Ziblan with 5% has a much higher rare of sol solubility. That means more rare earths can be put into the glass without crystallization. And these rare earths, they show the fluorescence which is then turned into a lasing action. And therefore, to build a very compact, that means a short length laser, uh, it's important to have a high rate of concentration. So from, from a compactness point of view, Ziblan clearly has an advantage. Now, how to create then waveguides in a bulk glass? And this is done by a femtosecond laser writing process. So the femtosecond laser focuses into the glass, provides a high energy, which then even melts the glass. And this changes then the, ref the refractive index. For the Ziblan glass, interestingly, a, a negative refractive index change is obtained. And so the cladding of the fiber is uh, written. So this is here the core and the cladding, as you can see here, uh, lower index dots are written by the femtosecond laser. And this is really similar to microstructured fibers where we have the air holes Air has an index of 1.0, glass of 1.5. And so this is then here the cladding. And the cladding has to be a lower index compared to the core. So that then by a total internal reflection, the light is trapped in the glass core. So this work is not done in my group. This is in collaboration uh, with Michael Withford's group at Macquarie University and with David Lancaster's group at uh, University of South Australia. And also uh, he has affiliation with the University of Adelaide. I will not go into detail with this, just pointing out that they achieved compact lasers in the mid-infrared with the Ziblan we produced at IPAS in the mid-infrared using thulium and holmium uh, rare of ions. And recently now uh, Dave's group uh, worked on extending from just making a laser to creating du dual frequency combs. And this will be really the starting point for our collaboration in the new center of excellence, the Combs Center. Next uh, application area, lyst-based sensing with fibers. So sensing have the uh, fibers have the advantage for sensing that the light is based on light, uh, not on electricity, so no ele electromagnetic interference. A fiber is small, 100 to 200 micrometer in diameter, so it can be used in hard to access areas 
like for example in vivo it's also because it's as small and lightweight it is also uh, fibers ideally suited for making portable sensors fibers can be very long and so this is ideal for remote sensing the challenge is that traditional glasses they are inert to the environment and traditional fibers with the solid core uh, surrounded by a solid cladding the light is really trapped in the core and is not affected by the environment and that's important for telecom telecommunication fibers because the light should be transported from one location to the other without being disturbed by the environment and so therefore to use fibers for sensing it's important to add uh, functionality via coatings and also to achieve a large overlap between the light and environment through certain structures. And so this is possible uh, by placing functional materials or active materials directly into the fiber core materials placing coatings at the end of the fibers. So if the light is coming out of the fiber, then it can interact with the coating. Another way is to have uh, the coating along the uh, surface of the uh, fiber uh, core. And another way is having hollow core fibers and then filling these, for example, with the liquid for the sensing. And so uh, in the first case, this is really the, the, the fiber itself is then a functional material. In the other case, it's the fiber plus a, cur a certain coating. So I will focus on these three fiber types. We'll not talk about the holocore fiber here. So first example, magnetic field uh, sensing by uh, doping directly diamond particles into the glass and then turning this glass or this preform to fiber. So this started uh, more than a decade ago, a collaboration with RMIT University, also uh, then later on University of Melbourne. And you see here the, the uh, two uh, key papers that came out of this uh, collaboration. So we worked on the fabrication of the, uh, the fibers and the collaborators, they worked then on the characterization and also on uh, the magnetic field sensing. So uh, nitrogen vacancies in diamonds, so, so yeah, it's a vacancy in diamond, a defect center, which shows a characteristic fluorescence, and this fluorescence is sensitive to magnetic fields. And so therefore it's important uh, or to use the nitrogen vacancy centers for sensing, therefore it's important to excite and collect the uh, NV fluorescence. And uh, a, a optical fiber is perfectly suited for doing this. Because the fiber allows to couple the uh, emission of the nitrogen vacancy centers to a waveguide mode, and this enhances the emission capture. And so many people over the last decade worked on placing therefore diamonds on the core fibers. We have worked on the um, concept of placing the diamond particles inside the core of fibers. And so first we started uh, to work with telluride glass. And the reason is telluride, first we know telluride glass very well. It has a visible transmission which uh, overlaps then with the nitrogen vacancy excitation and emission. It has a low temperature, which we thought is important for the diamond survival. So we used uh, the so-called melt doping technique. So we have uh, our glass melt in a crucible, and then we take our uh, powders of uh, diamond nanoparticles and like putting spices into the soup, we put the nanoparticles into the glass melt, give it a swirl, put it back into the furnace for 10 minutes and then we cast the glass. So the first glass had this dark color which troubled me a little bit but people at RMIT, they were very happy. They saw the single photon emission. That means a diamond has survived. And we even could publish this in advanced materials. 
and uh, we were lucky the reviewer did not pick up if you have a dark glass it would of course not transmit over long lengths uh, in the visible so why making a fiber so that means then we wanted to make it really uh, over longer lengths so what is the, the origin of this dark color this then took us on to a journey of three to five years uh, optimization of up to 20 different fabrication uh, parameters in the end then we uh, succeeded and we achieved then as you can see here a transparent glass which still showed uh, the characteristic envy uh, fluorescence and this glass then we turned via extrusion and fiber drawing into a fiber and for this fiber then magnetic field sensing was demonstrated and this is done via optical uh, detected uh, magnetic uh, resonance so briefly you have the one dip if there is no magnetic field and this then two dips with the magnetic field and the dips they go further apart and this gives a measure of the magnetic field strength so we achieved a sensitivity of micro tesla per root hertz this is the unit how magnetic field sensitivity is given for diamond particles so we were very happy we could show magnetic field sensing from a distance but only in the order of one to ten percent of the diamond particles survived and telluride glass is a uh, fragile glass and therefore for practical applications not so suitable so therefore I was thinking for quite a while, how can we embed uh, diamond particles into more robust silicate glasses? And what happened then in parallel, a uh, Karen glass artist, Karen Cunningham, she was then at the gem factory in Adelaide. She collaborated with Dr. Philip Reinick at MIT University of placing diamond microparticles into traditional silicate glasses. And you see here the diamond particles, they're scattering, if they scatter, if they're the, uh, uh, the green excitation light, if this is filtered out, you see the red fluorescence of the diamond. And so this really inspired me that to uh, use a similar technology, which I then coined interface doping for making optical fibers with embedded diamond particles. So once more, the melt doping is placing the nanoparticles during the melting in the volume of the glass and the glass is then turned into fiber. So it's a volume or melt doping, but 95% uh, of the diamond particles did not survive. So with the, uh, what we then did, we moved from telluride to silicate glasses, from nano diamond to one micrometer size diamond. And we made a thin rod of lead silicate glass, dip coated it with the diamond particles, placed this into a glass tube, and this assembly was then drawn down to fiber so that we have now also the diamond particles localized at the surface of the core along uh, the length of the fiber. And really, we think both the micro diamond. Uh, size that means a larger amount of NV centers in the excitation volume plus this localization allowed us to achieve a higher sensitivity and using a more robust lead silicate glass. Next application is temperature sensing with coating on a fiber tip. So I'm also uh, showing a different fiber sensing architecture. So this is work really uh, led by uh, Eric Schartner at IPASS. So the aim was to build an in vivo temperature sensor. So fiber sensor that can be then implanted into a living animal. And the uh, um, concept was to use the temperature sensitive erbium fluorescence. So it's ratiometric and sensitive to uh, the temperature excitation is via upconversion so at, uh, not in the green but at 980 nanometer to avoid autofluorescence of tissue so this has the glass requirements upconversion emission 
transmission in the visible to near infrared, low phonon energy for the glass in a high ytterbium and erbium concentration. On the other side, Eric was also clear he wants to dip coat uh, traditional commercial silica fibers into the glass melt to create uh, just a small glass coating at the end of the fiber and then this fiber can be implanted into a living animal. So that means a glass is required with very low melting temperature relative to silica. And Telluride is perfectly suited for that. It has the right transmission window. I already mentioned the high rare earth solubility really illustrated here. So this glass here has um, uh, uh, up to 5 weight percent of rare of ions, low melting temperature of 700 to 900 degrees Celsius, and a high index of 2.0. I'll come back to this later on that this also has an advantage. So the fiber sensor was then uh, calibrated uh, the temperature. It was successfully implanted in a living animal and uh, the biologist could uh, measure the brain temperature successfully. Then in collaboration with uh, Jarvan, Lee and team, they um, uh, connected or integrated the fiber sensor with an uh, imaging fiber, an optical coherence tomography based imaging fiber. And so this then allowed image guided sensing shown here for brain tissue and uh, they uh, measured here the temperature at a very specific location in, in uh, the brain here, how the brain um, tissue then cools down. Next topic, very different application now, 3D volumetric display. This is a collaboration uh, also with uh, people from the School of Electrical and Mechanical Engineering and also the company, the Cortec Group in the US. And they approached us that they are interested in working with us, developing a glass for 3D volumetric display for these range of different applications. And so the concept is again taking the erbium, again an upconversion process, but now with two different wavelengths, 1.5 micrometer and 850 micrometer, uh, these two laser beams are perpendicular and where the two laser beams meet, uh, the excitation of the higher energy level can occur and from there then the green fluorescence, so visible fluorescence, that means uh, visible display. And so we found again Telluride glass is uh, perfectly suited for this. Uh, that people worked beforehand uh, on uh, Ziblan glass, uh, which has similar properties in terms of transmission, phonon energy, and high rare of solubility. But Ziblan has a, a low crystallization stability. In other words, it crystallizes easily, which prevents to make a large volume of glass. However, with Telluride it's possible, as shown as a proof of concept for this 2-inch cube, which would be hard if not impossible to make in Ziblan glass, because there would be crystals formed in the center, because the center cools down slower. Then we managed to do the first proof of concept experiment. So you see here the direction of the 850 nanometer excitation, the direction of the 1540 nanometer a direction where the two lasers uh, meet. There are two infrared lasers, so we can't see the colors, but where they meet, a green voxel is created. Few slides, again a different topic, coming back to sensing and nonlinear optical processing with the exposed core fiber platform. So I mentioned this already, these type of fibers. We have here the glass core in the center surrounded by air holes. Because of the air holes, portion of the light goes into air. Uh, the holes can be, for example, filled with liquid and this allows then light matter overlap. We make these exposed core variants of the suspended core fiber. Exposed core means now easy access to the environment for sensing but also for applying coatings.
So my first example is, uh, so we use this exposed core fiber for a range of new concepts, new coatings, new sensing concepts, but also uh, new uh, films for nonlinearity. Just will give very few examples. One is placing a silk coating on, which is a biocompatible polymer on the surface of the exposed core. There, from a physics point of view, it's important to find the right uh, coating thickness so that enough light is in the coating but uh, and in the glass uh, to achieve then the light matter overlap. And then they uh, doped uh, the silk with a rashiometric pH sensitive fluorophore, calibrated it, inserted uh, the fiber into a living animal, and then they could in vivo measure the pH uh, of uh, in vivo of the animal. Very different examples, uh, as you can see here just on the various papers, an ongoing collaboration with uh, the, the IPHT in Jena and also the, the University of Jena on uh, placing high index metal oxide coatings on our exposed core fibers. And so they started with exploring different film thickness to tailor the zero dispersion wavelengths, then film thickness gradient via magneton sputtering, and then very recently even they created a periodic film patterns, pattern, so even more a tailoring of, opt, of uh, optical properties. A different way then is to put 2D semiconductor coatings on exposed core fibers. Again, large team of collaborators. And so this is shown here schematically, so MOS2, placed uh, directly via chemical vapor deposition on the core of an exposed core fiber showing the photoluminescence and also second harmonic generation. We'll not go into detail. I think I'm coming close to the end. So another example is uh, gold nanoparticles in a telluride glass. Coming back to the diamond dog telluride glass, I showed or I mentioned the first samples that had dark color, more specifically blue in transmission and brown in reflection, so a dichroic behavior. This really reminded me on the Lacargus cup, where it's known it has gold and silver nanoparticles, therefore red in transmission, green in reflection. And I talked to quite a few people and they were not sure if this is because of gold nanoparticles, because of a difference in color. But then I found this paper, again, a high index glass and deliberately they placed gold into the glass and then turned it via annealing into gold nanoparticles and you see the similarities. So the difference in colors really telluride glass has a high refractive index. So that means we have with diamond an uncontrolled um, method of creating gold nanoparticles but I was in uh, interested in a controlled formation of the gold nanoparticles. But the first was how to get the gold into a controlled way into the glass. Because with the traditional method of adding gold salt, this did not work into a controlled manner because we couldn't dissolve all the gold added um, to uh, the glass batch. We always had this precipitation of large particles. So therefore, what we found out is also via the diamond work is we melt in a gold crucible. The gold crucible dissolves, so gold ions then go into the glass. And then, of course, as the glass melts, so it gets distributed throughout the whole glass volume. And via the melting temperature, and this is here a typo, this should be 800 and 850 degrees Celsius, the higher the glass melting temperature, the lower the glass viscosity and the more corrosive the glass melt is and the more gold gets dissolved into the glass. So we can really control the gold content in the glass via gold crucible uh, corrosion. So this is one part of creating gold nanoparticles in glass, having gold ions. And the second step is then turning the gold ions 
into gold nanoparticles. So again, we use the traditional way of uh, using, for example, tin ions, but this didn't work because we formed metallic tellurium, which has a dark color. And so therefore we, we were looking for an alternative method. And so we knew from diamond that adding diamond to a telluride glass melt containing gold ions creates gold nanoparticles. To our surprise, we got the same color when adding nano ruby to telluride glass powder. So we mix the, the, uh, the powder with nano rubies, uh, melted it and got this blue color. So, but the nano rubies have no reducing components on, on them. So what's going on here? So as a control experiment, we had no dopants. We just took the telluride glass powder and remelted it at the relatively low temperature. And we got this co uh, color. And here you see the characteristic plasmonic peak. So this is shown here once more uh, compared to a few other controlled experiments. And only if we reheat glass powder that contains, where the glass contains gold ions, we create the plasmonic peak that means gold nanoparticles. If we re uh, reheat, this should be um, uh, yeah, powder without the gold ions, we don't create the peak. And if we reheat bulk glass also, we don't create the plasmonic peak. So now that we knew that uh, glass powder reheating gives us access to controlled gold nanoparticle formation, we uh, put uh, both together. So with a melting temperature, we can control the gold content and therefore the gold nanoparticle concentration. With a reheating time and temperature, we now can control the gold nanoparticle size. And therefore also the, where is the plasmonic peak located, also the size distribution. And this gives really access to this large variety of colors. Now what we then did is, okay, if it works for telluride glass, would it also work for other glass? And so yes, it does. So this is here for germinate silicate glasses, also for silver and silver gold alloys. And because of different glass compositions have different refractive index, together with using gold and silver, we can create a variety of warm colors via the powder reheating technique. We work together again with Karen Cunningham, glass artist at the Gem Factory in Adelaide. She took our colored glass and turned it into glass art. We also used it for screen printing. And then two years ago, then we have formed a startup company, Easy Glass Technology, to commercialize this technology. So as a conclusion, I want to compare the glass types I mentioned. The Zeeblon, Telluride, Lead Silicate, and Silica. So here you see the temperatures, really typical characteristic temperatures, usually it's a range, glass transition temperature, extrusion, and drawing. So you see Zeeblon, Telluride, they both have these temperatures really on the low side, Silica on the high side, and Lead Silicate in the middle. In terms of refractive index, Zeeblan and silica low index, telluride really high index, and lead silicate also high index. I want to point out the low phonon energy for Zeeblan and telluride glasses and the high ray of solubility. I mentioned this also that the Zeeblan glass has a low volume and surface crystallization stability which poses challenging challenges in terms of the, the shaping of glass, the melting. And uh, we asked telluride and lead silicate glasses are much easier to handle because they have a high crystallization stability. And really this mixture or combination of properties then determines the applications. And so this low phonon energy, low index, really then 
is ideal for the next generation of telecommunication fiber. And we just have to find a way of dealing with the low crystallization stability. The same also the high rate of solubility is good for fiber lasers and waveguide lasers. The telluride, because of this high crystallization stability, is therefore really uh, well suited for volumetric display application and temperature sensing. And we also use it, uh, therefore, as a Zeeblan proxy. So many things we first test with telluride, it's cheaper, easier, before we translate it to Zeeblan. The lead silicate is sort of in the middle, therefore it's perfect for prototyping using the extrusion and it's such a forgiving glass. And uh, often then we translate it either in this direction or in that direction. So for example, the first exposed core fiber, we made it first via lead silicate and uh, via extrusion and then we translated it to using the milling technique and using silica. And uh, just I mentioned glass art in the abstract and really this slide is called a fine line between glass science and glass art. I talked about our colored glass technology and so one of the inventor, Jun Leve, made this uh, colored glass powder. Uh, uh, Junle and I and others, my team, we had a workshop at the Gem Factory and there Tala Kalim, a glass artist, she helped me then using the colored glass from Junle to turn it into these uh, glass art pieces that I made myself. Here you see real glass art made by Talim, again made with the colored glass that we made. And I would like to point out uh, that uh, our colored glass is perfectly compatible to the clear glass because we can take a clear glass and use then the powder reheating technology. And last slide is we have open PhD and postdoc positions available for the industry laureate research program, but also under the center of excellence. Thank you very much for your attention. So you mentioned earlier that only 5% of the diamonds, nano diamonds, uh, survived, I guess, in the, uh, when you're making the fibers. Is that because the rest of them precipitated out or something? Now uh, the, the oxides attacks it. And so then uh, carbon is, uh, um, diamond is carbon, carbon plus oxide. And so we found then also quite a lot of bubbles in the glass, which we think is CO2. I was wondering about the z and getting down to really below the, uh, the silica. Um, maybe you can outline a few steps how you uh, try to achieve it. Mm. And so far, it's kind of the state of the art right now regarding mm. the z -Blend. So we are currently here, we could be there. And there, that one is the, 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 the crystallization. So there's the theory that during the fiber drawing, really nanocrystals are formed because the glass is heated above the glass transition point. Under microgravity, uh, one, uh, so for forming a crystal, one needs to have crystal growth. So atoms need to be uh, moved within the glass. Under microgravity conditions, one force, the gravity is missing, so no convection can happen. And this then reduces the crystal growth. And in the last 20 to 30 years, there have been experiments done that really show for uh, reheating Zeeblan glass, for example, in parabolic flights, uh, that there is suppressed crystal growth. And so this is now we work therefore with flawless uh, photonics. We made a fiber preforms uh, for them and hopefully they will be soon drawn successfully to fibers so that then we can compare fibers drawn under microgravities with fiber drawn on earth with gravity and we compare the loss. And so the this is worldwide the best uh, Z-Blend 
This one here? Yeah. yeah. And that is grown on the ISS? No, this is, no, this is, uh, uh, there is, there have been, I was told, up to 30 fiber drawing trials, not only with flawless photonics, also with companies on the ISS. But so far I could not find any publication on the result of these fiber, uh, uh, of, yeah, fiber drawing trials in terms of optical loss. So obviously it is very challenging without having the gravity how to initiate the fiber draw, how to do it. And so this will be interesting now with uh, Flawless uh, uh, Photonics with their engineering team. So hopefully they succeed in making successfully fiber so that we can measure the fiber loss and look at this uh, uh, concept of uh, microgravity. The other is the absorption, so the raw material purification. So I started now to uh, hire a, a postdoc and student in uh, chemistry to purify the raw materials. And purification is one thing. The other thing is we need to achieve purities in the order of sub-PPB level for example, for iron, copper, nickel, and cobalt. And for the preliminary work we have done, uh, we find it's, we are already at uh, below the detection limit, but the detection limit is one ppm. So we also need to sort of do a lot of work in the trace metal analysis. I only just realized the microgravity is not on Earth in the question time. That's exciting. It, is there a way you could have a drop cast facility? Like there's a shot tower in Melbourne where they used to make bullets. Is that it, feasible? It's it's a few seconds, yeah. uh, but fiber drawing you need uh, in the order of uh, the glass is about 10 minutes in the hot zone. 